Okay, hi there, everyone. Um, I'd like to welcome you to the Antarctic session of the Australia China Joint Workshop on Biodiversity Law and Governance. Uh, so, my name is Indy Hodson Johnson, and I'm an adjunct senior researcher um, of Antarctic Law and Policy at the Institute of Marine and Antarctic Studies at the University of Tasmania, and also the Chief Operating Officer of the Australian. Uh, Centre for Excellence in Antarctic Science. Uh, and today I'm coming to you from the lands of the Moonea people in Lutruwita, and I pay my respects to Elders past and present and to the many Aboriginal people that did not make Elder status and to the Tasmanian Aboriginal community that continue to care for country. And of course, I acknowledge the Indigenous people of all the lands on which you're meeting from and um, greetings to our many friends from overseas as well. Um, obviously, Antarctica and area of massive environmental change um, and today we're hearing from four fantastic spe speakers with a depth and breadth of experience from many different perspectives um, I'd like to thank them for their time today um, and uh, how today will work is that we've got 15 minutes for presentations and then I'll take a couple of specific questions if we get them through the chat in the Q&A um, but then I want to perhaps have a, that Q&A session at the end, um, have a bit more of a round table. So we'll, we'll leave most of the questions to the end and I'll facilitate that. Um, I'll put my hand up speakers at about two minutes to go of the 15 minutes and then um, probably uh, interrupt you if you go too far over 15 minutes. Um, and yeah, please put your questions in the Q&A bit. Um, so I'll introduce each of the speakers as they come on board. Um, so our first speaker today is Professor Lee Chen. Uh, Professor Chen is, from, is the Vice Dean and Professor of International Law at Fudan University, University School of Law. Uh, she is the Standing Counselor of China Private International Law Association and Arbitrator of the Shanghai International Arbitration Centre. Uh, Professor Chen obtained her uh, Bachelor of Law uh, her master's and PhD from Fudan University and postgraduate diploma in common law from Hong Kong University. And she specializes in private international law, international economic law and Antarctic governance. And in recent years, she's completed several uh, government sponsored research programs focusing on reform of Chinese arbitration law, non-government and China's non-market economy status under the international trade revenue laws and Antarctic governance as well. And she's published many, many, many um, articles. She's a visiting scholar of the Max Planck Institute and uh, many other places and today Professor Chen is going to present on the legal implementation of the Madrid Protocol in China. So welcome Professor, thank you for your time and over to you. Thank you. Okay, thank you Yindi. Thank you for your kind uh, introduction uh, to me and also uh, thank you uh, the organizer. Thanks the organizer to invite me to attend uh, this uh, exciting uh, workshop. So I have the opportunity to have the dialogue with my, uh, my uh, dear uh, Australian colleagues here. So it's my pleasure. So I will share my slides with you. So wait for a moment. Okay. Can you find my slides? Yes. And then I will have the full, I think, full screen. Not yet. Not yet, okay. It's okay? Perfect. No? Yes. Okay. okay, so. Uh, the subject I want to share with you is the uh, legal implementation of Madrid Protocol in China. So this is a purely legal issue here. Okay. So uh, the first part, I think we should know the roots of the protocol, the Madrid Protocol. So uh, the main issue of the protocol we know is the environmental protection in the ATS. However, the 1959 Antarctic Treaty uh, has uh, the safeguarding the peace and the freedom of scientific research. And 
uh, in Antarctica as the pillar. And the environmental protection is not the main purpose of this treaty. So the, in the early time of 1959, uh, uh, environmental protection is not the main purpose of the treaty. So after the Antarctic Treaty, various uh, measures on the protection of Antarctic environment were de uh, developed under Article 9 of the treaty or in separate uh, conventions. Article 9, uh, we know, is the uh, is a very important article. So we know the ATCM comes from the uh, Article uh, 9. Okay, so the following are the uh, uh, legal measures or uh, separate uh, conventions under the ATS. The first one is the 1964, the agreed measures, agreed measures for the conservation of Antarctic fauna and the flora. And the second one is the so-called CCS, Antarctic Sales Convention, right? And the third one is the Code of Conduct for Antarctic Expeditions and the Station Activities. Uh, the, fifth, uh, the first one is the Convention for the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources. And I found that as, uh, two of my uh, uh, Australian uh, colleagues will uh, have to speak on the Kamala issues, okay? And the last one is the Convention on the Regulation of Antarctic Mineral Resource Activities, though it is uh, not effective. Okay, so it is not effective convention. However, this is also a convention uh, relating to the uh, env Antarctic environmental protection. So this is the uh, general framework before the protocol was uh, drafted and was accepted. So we know that the important part of the protocol is based on the earlier instruments within the ATS, which improve the internal coherence of these corpus juris. It's like a code, right? So uh, under the uh, protocol, there are six annexes. Uh, annex one is the Environmental Impact, Impact Assessment, EIA, Annex. Annex two is the Conservation of Antarctic fauna and the flora. So based on the earlier uh, uh, agreed measures. And next three is the waste disposal and the waste management. And the four is the prevention of marine pollution. And next five is the air pro uh, protection and the management, uh, which uh, mainly govern the ASPAS and ASMAS. And next six, is relating to the liability arising from environmental emergency. And so far the Annex 6 was, I remember it was drafted uh, in uh, uh, 2005, in the year of 2005, and so far has not been effective. Okay. And the, the, the topic I want to uh, share with you is the international and the domestic implementation of Madrid protocol in China. So first of all, we should know how to understand the so-called implementation of international agreement or international convention. I think this is a very general and also very important topic under the international public law, international public law. So the so-called implementation of international agreement means that all the measures taken or instruments used both at the international level and the domestic level to fulfill the objectives of the international agreement. So this is the definition of the so-called implementation of international agreement. Okay, for the protocol, uh, to implement the protocol at the international level include, but not limited to the following. The, number one, the assessment of draft CEE at the CEP meetings and the ATCFs. Number two, the adoption of management plans for ASPAS, special uh, protected areas. The, number three, conduct of international uh, inspection uh, activities separately or jointly. So this is the uh, uh, main uh, issue and for, for, for the in implementation of the protocol at the international level. The domestic implementation okay, of the uh, protocol 
uh, in its broad meaning is the subject of Article 13 of the Madrid Protocol, which should lead to compliance with the protocol. And it is hope to a comprehensive uh, protection of Antarctic environment as specified by Article 2 of the protocol. So here, the following is the uh, contents of Article uh, 13, sub-Article 1, titled Compliance with this Protocol. Sub-Article 1 provides that each party shall take appropriate measures within its competence, including the adoption of laws and regulations, administrative actions, and enforcement measures to ensure compliance with this protocol. So this is the basic requirement for the contracting parties to implement the uh, Madrid protocol into their domestic law. So I think this article include two parts. The first part or two steps. The first step is how to incorporate the relevant provisions on the, the protocol and its nexus into the domestic, domestic legal order. So this is the first step, the legislation incorporate the uh, relevant provisions of the protocol and its annexes into the domestic law. And then the second step is practical application and enforcement of domestic laws, okay? Include organizational aspect, handling application for permits, supervision and enforcement and enforcement. But we know that not all the provisions under the uh, protocol needs to be incorporated into the domestic law. So the protocol includes the following uh, main provisions, four types of provisions under the protocols. And among them only, I think the second and the third kind of uh, uh, provisions should be incorporated into the domestic law which include the provisions directly referring to rights and obligations of individuals. And the second way is the provisions containing definitions and the proclaiming purposes and objectives, which should be taken into account when interpreting the provisions under the above types of provisions and others is need, need not to be incorporated into the domestic law. So, this is the uh, provisions which need to be incorporated. And the main issues under the domestic applicable laws, I think including the following. The first one is the, sec the scope of the implementation legislation. And under the scope of implementation legislation, it is include the geographical scope of application of legislation, the values that are protected by the domestic law, Antarctic law, and the jurisdictional matters, the activities that are covered by the legislation. Okay, and the second issue under the domestic law is the EIA. The EIA is deemed as the sign call nine of effective environmental regulation. It's very important. And the third one should be incorporated into the domestic law is authorizing human activities in Antarctica, that is the permit system, okay? The first one is the supervision and the enforcement, especially for the enforcement, is uh, means the sanctions available at the domestic level to react to a violation of the implementing law is the essential conditions for the effectiveness of domestic legislation. So how about China? How the China how China implement the uh, Madrid Protocol uh, into the domestic law? Before I make an uh, introduction to the, uh, the, the the Chinese domestic uh, law to implementing the protocol, I, I would like to uh, uh, share the the, the 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 general. I think this is the general rule or general uh, approaches that China adopted to implement international treaties, international treaties. So there are two approaches to uh, apply or implement international treaties in China. The first one is the direct application of international treaties that China has ratified. Okay, that China has ratified. And this kind of treaties, what kind of treaties can be directly applied in China? The treaties, 
relating to the so-called civil and the commercial matters. So under the Chinese law, the international treaties China has acceded relating to the civil and the commercial matters can be directly applied and the preferable, uh, preferably applied by the Chinese court. By the Chinese court, for example, the 1958 New York Convention on Recognition and Enforcement of Foreign Arbitral Award and uh, the 1980 the Convention on International Sale of Goods. And the most other international treaties China has acceded can only be indirectly applied or implemented by uh, in China, in China. Okay, it should be transferred into the domestic law instead of directly incorporation. Okay, so how about the Madrid Protocol and the other international conventions under the ATS? I think the Madrid Protocol and its annexes should be indirectly applied and implemented in China. That means it should be in, uh, transferred into the Chinese law, Chinese domestic law. Then uh, it will be in, uh, implied as a domestic law, okay? And we also know that supervision and the enforcement of legislation in Antarctica is uh, pro problematic because of the geographical uh, position of the area. It's very remote. Okay, from the, uh, the, the human center, right? And the cost involved in sending government officials to the area and the jurisdictional questions. So a lot of uh, problems. And the, uh, I also want to uh, uh, share with you that the legislation hierarchy in general in China. So according to the uh, legislation law of the People's Republic of China, which was amend amended in 2015, uh, the hierarchy of the Chinese law includes the following. The top is the constitutional law. And then the second level is the laws by the National People's Congress and its standing committee. And the third level is the administrative reg regulations by the state council. And then the fourth one is the divisional regulations. So rem why it, I, this is highlighted by the yellow because so far, the Chinese domestic and tactic law stop at the first level. Okay, at the first level is the regulation, divisional regulation. And the last one, the bottom is the local regulations by local people's Congress and the local government. So we, we should know uh, the Chinese law, uh, Chinese domestic uh, and tactic law, I think is at the first level, the divisional regulation. So this is the uh, legislations or the regulations uh, in China to implement uh, the protocol. So uh, there are four uh, related regulations. All the regulations are promoted uh, uh, or adopted by the state oceanic administration. So that's why I said it's a divisional uh, regulation, right? So the first one is the regulation for administrative permit for Antarctic expeditions. So in short, permit regulation, 2014. The second one is relating to the environment, uh, environment impact assessment of Antarctic expeditions. In short, EIA regulations, 2017. And the third one is the so-called regulation on management of this, uh, uh, I'm sorry, environment management regulations on activities in the Antarctic. In short, management regulation, 2018. And the last one, is the so-called regulation on management of visits to the Antarctic stations of China. Uh, in short, visit regulation is also uh, adopted in 2018. So four related regulations, okay? So how about, the, what's the relationship between among the four uh, regulations? So I would like to introduce the general, uh, the purpose for uh, adopt the related regulations and its general framework and the, the main contents. The permit regulation 2014, the purpose is to standardize the conduct of the administrative permit for Antarctic expeditions, fulfilling the rights and obligations as set forth in the ATS, insurance orderly undertaking of Antarctic uh, expeditions. And its framework includes five chapters, general provisions, application and acceptance, 
review and the decision, supervision, and supplementary provisions. The EIA regulations 2017, the purpose is to enhancing uh, the environment management, preventing Antarctic expeditions from adverse impacts on the Antarctic environment and the ecosystem, fulfill rights and obligations as set, as set forth in the treaty and the protocol. And the, the framework of the EIA regulation also includes five parts, five chapters. And the relationship between these two regulations is that the EIA regulation is subject to the permit regulation. Since the EIA regulation is based on the permit regulation. Okay. So this uh, is Professor uh, Chen, we're just coming up to time now. Oh, okay. So so far. So, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, then, no, no, it's okay. Amazing. Okay, management regulation and uh, the, the visit regulation. And the relationship between them is that the visit regulation is subject to the management regulation. And the management regulation is a high, kind of comprehensive, it's a new regulation and it's also comprehensive regulation governs all the activities, okay, conducted in the Antarctica. And then, uh, I also want to share with you the geographic scope of the application. And uh, here, I think the time limit, I just want to show you the, 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 the main uh, articles here uh, about uh, the, 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 the Chinese domestic law on the geographic uh, scope of application. And then the values that are protected, okay? And the, whether Antarctic values are protected by the Chinese regulations are still not quite clear. Okay, and the, the jurisdictional scope of application of legislation. Okay, the, per, the stip, uh, stipulations under the protocol and the Chinese, uh, the stipulations under the Chinese uh, regulation. Okay, and then is uh, the last one is the activities that are covered by the legislation. By the legislation. So since time limits, I just want to show you the slides here and uh, uh, give a brief uh, uh, comments and uh, uh, conclusions. And in recent years, China has incorporated the main provisions of the protocol, including the scope of application, the authorization or the permit, the EIA and the supervision into domestic law as a responsible and accountable ATCP. And the second conclusion is that the regulations implementing the protocol are proper problematic due to its inconsistency internally and also its inconsistency with the protocol. The last one, but not the least, for the purpose of incorporate the, the enforcement part, i.e. the sanction part, the regulations implementing the protocol need to be upgraded from the divisional regulations to a comprehensive and a coherent uh, piece of law made by the Standing Committee of the NPC. So that's the uh, uh, main contents uh, I want to share with you. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much for that, Professor Chen. Okay. Um, I have so many questions, um, but I'm not allowed to do that because I'm the chair. Um, but I think, uh, look, I don't see, oh, here we go. Um, we have one question. And look, I think we've got we've got a minute to, to address it because um, I don't want to seem too rushed here. But um, so we've got a question from Sri Watini and it says, how is the environmental impact assessment um, conducted concerning the Antarctic. Oh, hang on. Um, <clears throat> look, um, Sri, we, we might we might leave that general that broader question to the to the end. Um, so can I get you to hold that one because that's a broader one that I think the the panel in general might want to to um, tackle as a thing. So don't worry, we're not ignoring that. I won't I won't dismiss that one. I'll keep that one open. Um, so thank you so much everyone um, and Professor Chen. And what we'll do is now go on to um, Associate Professor Yi Tong Chen from Ocean University in China. Um, so uh, Professor Chen is an Associate Professor of um, the Law School at the Ocean University of China and a Research Fellow of the Polar Research Centre. Um, she was a visiting scholar of um, Elizabeth Hobbs School of Law at Pace University in the United States. Um, her research area includes the international public law, law of the sea,
polar law and international environmental law. And Professor Chen has published more than 20 articles and book chapters in Chinese and English, and has published one academic monograph on Arctic law, and has frequently participated in, um, in uh, international and domestic conferences. Um, she's chaired many research projects at many levels, including ministerial, um, and has been a member of Board of Governors at the University of the Arctic, and she has participated as an advisor in a Chinese delegation at the Commission at Kamla um, and the Antarctic Treaty Consultative Meetings. So today, Professor Chen is going to present a brief analysis of the discussion of Antarctic bioprospecting at the ATCM meetings from um, the past 10 years, uh, 20 years, and Chinese engagement. So Professor, a warm welcome to you and over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. So could you hear me and see the screen, right? Yes, all good. Thank you. Okay. Before I start, I to, uh, want to say some words uh, before this presentation because I already missed the chatting time. So uh, actually, my last time abroad was in Tasmania when I visit IMAS in November 2018. And the last foreign scholar that I met physically offline, that is uh, Professor Marcus Howard in our current panel. So that was in October in 2019 before uh, COVID-19 occurred to the global world. So I think this panel actually means a lot to me personally and also emotionally. And I think it also echoes what Professor Neng Ye said yesterday morning that the spirit of this conference will definitely promote the mutual understanding and uh, communication between the scholars and civil societies. Uh, between China and Australia. So today I want to uh, talk about the, uh, the recent uh, research on the discussions of Antarctic bioprospecting in the ATCM and the period actually between 2002 to 2021st and a little uh, engagement about China's recent activities on this issue. So before we start, I have to uh, hear. Hmm? Okay, so we have to, uh, so what is the definition of bioprospecting? Actually, the bad news is we haven't uh, have a working definition under the ATCM. And uh, even uh, ATCM already issued the resolution 16, 2013, but until now we still don't have the working definition. And various forum already talked about uh, bioprospecting in the world, but uh, under the ATCM mechanism, we have not yet uh, concluded the working definition. So the bioprospecting uh, has been considered by ATCM since early 2000, uh, and the SCAR actually once provided two definitions in its 2019 and 2009 survey. So the first is the collection of biological material and the analysis of its material properties or its molecular, biochemical, or genetic content for the purpose of developing a commercial product. Or you could choose the second one, the search for valuable chemical compounds and genetic material from plants, animals, and the microorganisms. So please remember this definition because I will not repeat them. So my presentation concludes three parts. The first is the overview based on my research method and uh, uh, the results I discovered, and then the details and argument. And the third part is my concurrence. So uh, all the uh, documents and the materials that uh, I collected and uh, used for my research actually are from this very useful and functional database all operated by the Secretariat of the Antarctic Treaty. So, uh, okay, I fixed the time period between 2002 to uh, 2021. Why I choose the 2002 as a starting point because that was the year uh, that UK submitted the first official working paper rounding the topic of fire prospecting in Antarctic Treaty. So I collected a total number of 43 working paper and information paper. So we know that on the, uh, so, so in, on the ATCM, only the consultative parties plus the three uh, observer, Scott, Camelan, and Comnam could submit working paper. And uh, 
collect uh, 27 information papers. So the CPs and non-CPs plus uh, IATO could uh, submit uh, information paper. So, uh, okay, I try my best to use the quantitative method because I'm a totally legal background researcher and also use the qualitative methods and give a thorough and detailed review of the uh, total uh, documents. Uh, WP and IP and uh, check and uh, analyze the different positions of this uh, contracting party. So the results here I demonstrate is not uh, the whole result of my paper, just uh, the results I want to dis uh, display today for my presentation. So the first is uh, I want to give you a rough and a very brief methodological analysis of the WP and IP on a barrel prospecting in ATCM. Second is a basic discussion on this issue uh, on the ATCM and uh, analyze some core uh, legal issue and uh, also the controversies. And third is my observation and comments on the regulation on bioprospecting on the uh, Antarctic Treaty System. So uh, the, the first table, actually it uh, summarized on the topic of bioprospecting in the past ATCM uh, submitted by uh, all these contracting parties. So we could see the here, uh, Okay, Netherlands ranked first uh, by uh, submitting total number of 14 WP and IP and then come to second that is uh, Belgium, uh, Belgium. And then we have UNEP and uh, SCAR. Uh, these uh, non-state uh, actor actually submitted much useful uh, scientific reports to us to this issue. And the next table, it uh, shows us a comparison of the documents submitted by these parties on the ATCM on the topic of fire prospecting. And we could see that uh, in 2009, we, have, we are on a high peak and uh, there is a growing, uh, a gradually drop down in the following years, but we embrace the second peak in 20, uh, 20, uh, 18. So what happened in 2009 and 2018? So I will talk about it later. And this is the uh, third table actually uh, shows the number of bioprospecting documents by different uh, parties. So I have to say I uh, combined and uh, counted all the WP and IP together here and attributed to different parties who submitted them. So if some parties submitted together, for example, Australia and New Zealand submitted together, so I will count uh, one for each a submitting party. So the blue line, uh, the, the folded line actually shows the comparison of the number of documents submitted by uh, parties in all years. So here still the Netherlands uh, and we should, uh, we could see that the, 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 the frequency, right, submitted by Netherlands. So here are some key moments uh, that uh, we have to know about the bioprospecting in uh, ADCM. And actually we know that the mayors actually the, the legally binding and effective after the uh, consultative parties approved them uh, uh, in the ADCM. And the resolution actually not legally binding, but shows the good political view and consensus about the, uh, in, uh, 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 of the contracting parties uh, on, uh, in ADCM. So, until now, we only have three uh, resolution on bioprospecting. The first is a resolution seven in 2005, and then uh, we come to resolution nine uh, titled with the collection of use of Antarctic biological uh, material. And then the res resolution six after 2013, we uh, didn't uh, issue any resolution on this topic. So this is the timeline of bioprospecting in ATCM actually. So I, uh, selected the very important uh, documents, I think, here, but uh, they are much more important and useful documents. But uh, this is the key timeline to, 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 to have to be mentioned here. So I have to say that I didn't account, uh, I didn't count, I didn't count the the paper submitted by SCAR in 1999, uh, the IP uh, 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 123, into my a diagram, but I want to say it because a SCAR is the first uh, paper uh, even titled with scientific research, not the bioprospecting, but it, it mentions much content about uh, bioprospecting. And the two highlight point here is the first SCAR, I think there 
At present, there appears to be no provision in the AT to deal with the exploration of uh, biological resources in the Antarctic. And the second highlighting point here is uh, ATS might uh, need to be extended to include the regulation of bioprospecting and indeed all the provisions of the CBD. It is important for the treaty to adopt the merits of the CBD. And then we come to the first official uh, doc documents, uh, first official working paper submitted by UK. Uh, I summarize two highlighting points. First is UK suggests uh, CEP to consider this issue and uh, uh, matters covered by Annex uh, two of the fifth session of the CEP. So finally, in this year, ATCM agreed with CEP that bioprospecting was a very important uh, matter. The meeting uh, finally agreed that BP also raised legal and political issue as well as environmental issues. So then the, uh, in, in 2005, ATCM uh, published the first resolution on uh, bioprospecting in uh, Antarctic and recommended that the first, all the contracting parties uh, should draw to the attention of their national Antarctic programs and research institutes to engage in Antarctic bioprospecting activities, uh, the provisions of Article uh, 3, one, uh, which is the freedom of scientific investigation of the AT. And second, the, uh, the governments continue to uh, keep under review the question of BP in the AT area and exchange on an annual basis information and views relating to the questions as appropriate. And then the next uh, 2009 resolution, so uh, it recalls much content in 2005 and also recall the freedom of scientific investigation. And 2003, the third uh, resolution here, so highlight uh, one, two, three, four, four points here. So the ADCM note, uh, noted the lack of working definition of BP in Antarctic context and reaffirm the ATS is the appropriate framework for managing the collection of um, uh, biological material in the AT area for considering uh, its use and uh, studies recommend that their government's report as appropriate on BP carried out under their respective legal regimes and encourage to improve the uh, information change, consider whether to adopt the EIES uh, for this purpose. So I want to drag you uh, your attention to uh, another international platform outside the ATCM, actually that is CBD. So uh, these are two key moments of bioprospecting uh, happening in CBD, but I think it has very important implications for uh, this uh, topic uh, under ATCM. So the first is 2008. Uh, the CBD's ninth COPS conference. So in, in this conference, it issued the annex first of decision uh, for uh, 12. So, and summarized three uh, reference to the AT area and all these three references worked as uh, three options uh, to be considered. The first is the international regime on access and the benefits sharing does not apply to uh, the, the clause F genetic resources located in the Antarctic area. But the second and the third uh, option actually are quite opposite. So in the further elaboration and negotiation of the international regime on access and benefit sharing, uh, the GR located in, we all give rise to the GR uh, uh, located in the AT area and special consideration will be given to the GR located in the AT area. And in two, 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 uh, two, two years later, so in 2010, the 10th uh, COPS, uh, so the Nagoya Protocol on Access and on Genetic Resources and the Fair and Equitable Sharing of Benefits arising from their utilization to the CBD. So I highlight two points, which I think is has the uh, implication for the ATCM. So the first is applies. Uh, to GR that are covered by the CBD and to the benefits arising for their uh, utilization. And the, this Nagoya protocol does not apply to the AT area, only applies within the national jurisdiction of countries. And, and we actually much content in CBD has some influence to the current topic in ATCM, but I think these two are the key moments. So uh, I sum, uh, uh, here the, the second part. So I summarized, some core legal issues and controversy. The first is the conflict uh, between the freedom of scientific research and the uh, commercial activity actually uh, has the nature of confidentiality. So bioprospecting is unique in that 
the true value does not lie intrinsically in discovered and collected uh, components, but in the knowledge derived therefrom. So the biotechnology uh, industry draws benefits from scientific results. The holders of such a patent enjoys a usage monopoly on the patented components of its intervention. So the Antarctic Treaty requires free availab uh, availability of the scientific research results carried out in the region, so which reflected in the Article 3. So here we come to uh, two questions. So first is, is it possible to acquire intellectual property rights on research results without violating this requirement? And then the next, is there an ensuing profit sharing obligation? So. To solve the conflict between the freedom of, uh, freedom of scientific research and commercial activities. So uh, in the 20, last 20 years of working paper and information papers, I summarized these two opposite opinion plus one uh, practical uh, suggestion here. So the first is any solution. So some parties think since it is already hard to distinguish between such activities in practice, so all BP activities should be governed by Article 3 of the Annex 2 of the Protocol on Environmental Protection to the AT. Or another opposite opinion here, that is, the acquisition of uh, IP rights is governed by international instruments and national legislations, and that it is not possible to specifically regulate this matter with the framework of the ATS. It may not be necessary for the ATCM to develop additional regulations. So as the discovery product development, manufacturing and marketing stages of the bioprospecting chain occur, actually outside Antarctic. So domestic law would seem to be the most appropriate way to regulate them as is the case at present. So I think also this opinion echoes to what uh, Professor Chen just talked about the implementation of the Antarctic Treaty. So another, uh, 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 another legal issue I, I, I want to emphasize here, actually, that is the BBNG is a turning point and make much influence and implications to the, uh, the, the, the process of bioprospecting uh, discussed in the ATCM. So we all know that uh, we already have started the BBNG of, uh, intergovernmental negotiation in 2018, but actually it has a long history before 2018, right? So the UN General Assembly adopted, already adopted a resolution on oceans and, uh, and the law of the sea in 2006. And okay, I, I, because the time is very short, so I will skip this historical part and come to the analysis. So right now there are divergent views uh, both in the ATCM platform, but also in the uh, research community, community. Okay, that is whether we should wait and see for the current process and the negotiation of the forthcoming international uh, instrument on the BBNG. So the bioprospecting should be dealt with in ATS or other forum. So here we, we still have two opposite opinion and one uh, practical and detailed solution. The first is ATCM should not wait for the results of the work in this international forum, but should take the lead on the question of bioprospecting in Antarctic. And the second opposite opinion that is substantive steps in the framework of the ATS on a on complex issue transcending just Antarctic are unlikely to be helpful while these issues are under consideration in a broad forum. And actually I quite like this uh, practical and detailed solution actually uh, submitted and reflected in the Netherlands working paper. So it said, if a simple permitting system was established that only required the collector to notify the relevant authority of their activities and constraint or a, a, a compromise, that the collector would agree to share benefits should uh, they arise. And any effort to address the use and status of GR in marine areas in the AT area should acknowledge and be compatible with UNCLOS and the discussions on the species of UNGR uh, talking marine uh, ABNG. So China's engagement, actually, China uh, did not. Okay, uh, two, uh, two just pages. running out of time. 
Yep. Okay, two pages. Very quickly, okay. very quickly. Uh -huh. yep. uh -huh. So China did not submit uh, any WP or IP and didn't make too much comment if we, if we review uh, the, the the other documents and also the final uh, reports but uh, we observe more and more activities on buyer prospecting in AT area and i selected some practice here so it is not a complete uh, uh information yeah so for example from the uh here atcm uh 2009 uh information paper submitted by unap so it mentioned uh Chinese company that uh, uh, involved in the bioprospecting in Antarctic Treaty, uh, Antarctic uh, system. And uh, in ATCM uh, 39 IP uh, 133 paper, it highlights of patterns and applications that date from the period between uh, 2013 to 2015 mentioned uh, uh, at least three patents. And also we, we have a Qingdao company here, and in uh, ATCM 40, the IP 168, it highlights also the uh, contents of patents and application between 2015 uh, and 2017. And most content uh, are, uh, is about the uh, Antarctic uh, prospecting on the creel. So my uh, quick conclusion, so very brief, the BBNJ negotiations is a turning point and the spirit and principle of not, uh, not on the mind reflected in the current BBNJ negotiation already provide a functional and meaningful indication for ADS to face the BP and to resolve the regime of uh, conflicting and the distinct and inherited nature of the fragmentation of international law. So for uh, personally, I very trust the resilience and the legitimacy and also the flexibility and the capability of ATS to solve the regulation of BP because his story tell us, uh, told us okay, much information. And uh, the international cooperation is a must, especially the information sharing and reporting on ATS platform to deepen, uh, deepen the knowledge and understanding of BP and continue, uh, continuous progress. So about the conflict of the freedom of scientific, uh, scientific investigation and com uh, commercial use, actually, this is a question uh, frequently talked, not just in the AT area, but also in the other international platform in, in all over the world. So, but to solve this, the Antarctic Treaty consultative parties have to review and come back to the spirit of an Antarctic Treaty, that is the peaceful use, the, the freedom of scientific uh, uh, scientific uh, uh, information, blah, blah, blah. So, and uh, personally, I do not think the ambiguous and complex territorial claims is the key and final dilemma to block the solution of uh, BP. And very uh, premature and, uh, prediction by myself. Okay, so a matter of regulating BP is a must. All the ATS may have the, have to face the possibility that the mandate may gradually slip to BBNG or CBD or any other international forum. So which is not what ATCP want to see. So <laughs> want to emphasize here and. In Antarctic, we have more than penguins and also the biodiversity. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for that, Professor Chen. That's fantastic. Um, so what we'll do now is we'll move on to uh, Professor, uh, Dr. Robert Thomas, um, and we'll, we will um, have time for questions at the end, like I said. So, um, so don't worry, um, there will be time for those. And I see there's a couple more questions that have appeared in the, um, in the box, but we will, because um, they relate to the previous talk and we'll come back to those later on. So don't worry, um, we will come back to those. Um, so now I'd like to welcome Dr. Jess Melbourne Thomas. Uh, Dr. Melbourne Thomas is a senior research scientist with the CSIRO Oceans and Atmosphere down in Hobart and she leads a marine socio social ecological systems team um, in the research program down here and with a background in mathematical modelling and Antarctic climate change science, Jess's work is increasingly focused on connecting research to decision making for sustainability and climate change adaptation. Uh, Jess was a lead author for the IPCC 2019 special report on oceans and cryosphere in a changing climate and she's a co-chair for the International Marine Ecosystem Assessment for the Southern Ocean Program and leads the knowledge production theme in the Centre for Marine Socioecology. Uh, Jess was one of the Australia's first 
30 superstars of STEM and was named Tasmania's Young Talk of the Year in 2015 for excellence in research, science, communication and policy engagement. And she was the 2020 Tasmanian Australian of the Year. So today, Dr. Melvin Thomas is going to present on challenges and solutions for Antarctic marine biodiversity under climate change. So over to you, Jess, thanks so much. Thanks so much, Indy. And I'm just going to go ahead and attempt to share my screen. And thank you to Professor Chen and Associate Professor Chen for their um, wonderful presentations too. I must admit that, you know, having just heard that Antarctica is more than penguins, um, my first slide, if I can find it somewhere, uh, actually has a picture of penguins on it. Let's try again. It's not showing up for me for some reason. There we go. How does that Looks look, great. Indy? Okay, great. thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, and thank you to the organisers for the opportunity to be part of this um, exciting workshop and the panel today. So I'd like to start um, also by acknowledging the traditional owners of um, the land that I'm joining the meeting from. I'm also joining from Luchawida, Tasmania, and I acknowledge the Moanina people as the um, original custodians of this, um, of our land of waterways here. So in um, February this year, the IPCC released its sixth assessment report um, from Working Group 2 on impacts, adaptation and vulnerability. And across Chapter 6 of that report, which was led by uh, Andrew Constable and Sherry Lee Harper, um, assesses the climate change impacts and risks to ecosystems and biodiversity in polar regions, as well as options for adaptation and resilience building. And I'm going to draw quite heavily um, on that um, cross chapter paper in my presentation today. Um, so the chapter provides a, a pretty clear picture of challenges for biodiversity in Antarctica and the Southern Ocean. Um, and I, I thought I'd start with the five key messages that I distilled from um, from that report and that I think are, are relevant uh, for discussion today. So first, um, the assessment highlights that Antarctica is at the front line of climate change impacts, that um, there's ample evidence that the Southern Ocean will be profoundly different by 2050 under all um, emission and warming scenarios. Uh, one of the unique things about the Southern Ocean is that polar species have literally nowhere else to go as oceans warm and sea ice melts. Limits to adaptation are high in polar regions and um, the assessment indicates that maladaptation is possible, is probable actually. Uh, and finally, um, the assessment emphasises that what happens in um, the Southern Ocean, particularly in regards to biodiversity, but also um, physical and biogeochemical processes affects uh, everybody globally. And so I'll spend the rest of my presentation describing some of the evidence behind these key messages, both in terms of the challenges and also potential solutions. Um, so the IPCC's six assessment report clearly confirms what was already established in previous reports that Antarctica and the Southern Ocean are regions of large and rapid change, both now and projected into the future. Um, and I included this, this quote that, um, uh, that states this point really clearly, polar regions are experiencing impacts from climate change at magnitudes and rates that are among the highest in the world. Um, and as I indicated in my previous slide, will become pr profoundly different in the near term future under all warming scenarios. And this is just a snapshot from a media article that appeared at about the same time that the IPCC report was released, highlighting that this summer, um, Antarctic, this previous summer, Antarctic sea ice fell to the lowest level since measurements began in 1979. And while this particular record drop can't yet be linked to climate change, I think it does clearly highlight that things are changing uh, very quickly in Antarctica at the moment. Um, another key point for polar ecosystems and climate change is that these systems and the species that comprise them have nowhere to retreat to as conditions change. So contractions of the polar climate zones lead to distribution shifts and changes in food webs. They induce declines in many species and that has um, both impacts on commercial fisheries as well as threatening um, global dependence on polar regions for substantial marine food production. 
Uh, and the assessment of impacts and risks at different global warming levels from the IPCC report summary for policymakers for uh, sea ice dependent ecosystems in the Antarctic and also changes in krill fisheries um, is shown in this burning embers plot um, on the right. And so the level of risk for both of um, these elements is assessed as high. Uh, bordering on extreme for sea ice associated ecosystems at two degrees of warming above pre-industrial levels. And I'll come um, back to this point uh, a bit later. So while rising temperatures are a key part of um, impacts on biodiversity in the Southern Ocean, there are multiple drivers which can interact with each other to affect species in different ways. And so for Antarctic marine systems, these drivers include factors like changes in wind and circulation patterns, sea ice loss, glacial retreat and ice shelf collapse, um, changes in nutrient and freshwater input, ocean acidification, changes to primary productivity, um, and importantly, um, interactions with other human stresses like fishing, uh, pollutants and tourism. So what's actually happening and what's projected to happen in the future for Southern Ocean biodiversity. Um, so far, we've observed polewood contraction of the highest densities of krill in the Atlantic sector. Um, and we expect the distribution of other cold adapted species to shift in the future. And those that can't shift uh, may need to travel further for food or might uh, run out of habitat altogether. Um, benthic systems on the sea floor are changing and are expected to change in the future as a result of warming, as well as um, the really massive changes in light conditions that result from the disintegration of ice shelves. Uh, calcifying organisms, um, including benthic species, but also krill and other plankton like um, pteropods or sea butterflies are sensitive to ocean acidification. And we're learning more now about how those sensitivities um, vary depending on uh, life stages of different species, but also um, how they interact with other factors like light and nutrients. And so all of these changes have implications for the way that food webs function and the way in which energy flows through food webs from phytoplankton to zooplankton um, to, and to predators. I think it's important to recognise that the Southern Ocean, that in the Southern Ocean, the nature of um, climate driven changes to biodiversity and habitats and the way in which ecosystems are responding more generally is quite spatially variable. Um, and I guess that's not surprising given, you know, we're talking about very large spatial scales and dynamic environments, but it does present some challenges for understanding and responding to impacts. Um, and so the Marine Ecosystem Assessment for the Southern Ocean, or MESO, um, is an international collaboration of over 200 researchers from 19 countries, um, which has delivered the first ever circumpolar assessment of uh, status, trends and future risks for Southern Ocean biodiversity and ecosystems. Um, and in this MESO program, we've used those spatial subdivisions that I showed in my last slide to frame our assessment, which um, in turn has um, underpinned a large portion of the IPCC's recent assessment for Southern Ocean regions. Um, the IPCC six assessment report highlights that for polar regions, important factors influencing our ability to respond to climate driven ecosystem change um, include ecosystem based management, uh, access to high resolution ecological forecasts and projections and um, also the availability of climate informed advice which uh, climate informed advice which can promote uh, adaptation and resilience. Um, and importantly, um, coupling adaptation measures with global carbon mitigation strategies substantially decreases um, here risks to polar fisheries, but also to biodiversity. And so there are a range of adaptation options for Antarctic ecosystems, uh, ecosystem services, and also infrastructure in Antarctica. Um, but there are also significant limits to adaptation which will occur in the future and are related to the rate of warming 
uh, cascading changes that are occurring. Um, and in terms of biodiversity, the fact that polar species are already very highly adapted to cold conditions. Um, effective adaptation requires effective implementation. And while climate, a climate action plan exists for terrestrial and nearshore Antarctica, um, the assessment from the IPCC report is that governance for managing um, climate impacts is, is poorly developed for marine ecosystems, although some strategies have been proposed. So climate refugia that are free from um, compounding effects of human activities um, are essential for maximising resilience of species and ecosystem processes and also the um, ecosystem services that depend on cold polar habitats. And these refugia are needed because of um, the threat of overshoot of global warming beyond 1.5 degrees. So in this um, recent um, paper from Andrew Constable, he suggests that the most obvious places would be the Weddell Sea, um, the Ross Sea and um, Prids Bay, um, which would protect the southernmost areas of different Southern Ocean uh, subregions. Um, the strategy would mostly maintain resilience of Antarctic shelf systems, which actually doesn't naturally include the dominant food web uh, based on Antarctic krill, which occurs away from the continental shelf. And so the resilience of, um, of that food web would also benefit from protecting um, source locations of Antarctic krill and primary foraging areas of, of krill predators into the future. Um, I popped this slide in just at the last minute and I won't spend a long time talking through the complex diagrams. Um, this is from some work that um, looked at mapping the stakeholder landscape for Southern Ocean ecosystems. But I just wanted to highlight um, that this is obviously a very complex space in which to establish um, solutions. Um, and by understanding better the relationships amongst um, stakeholders and ecosystem services, I think we can um, move forward in terms of establishing these different kinds of options. I also wanted to come back to the point that what happens in the Southern Ocean affects everybody and that the global population is effectively the Antarctic population. We all have an interest in maintaining a healthy and biodiverse Southern Ocean ecosystem and investment in both observations and also dynamic ecosystem modelling at the circumpolar scale is really critical to help resolve what alternative futures could look like for Antarctic biodiversity. Um, and alongside the biodiversity values of, of Southern Ocean ecosystems, I also think that it's important to acknowledge our cultural connections with Southern Ocean biodiversity. And these are connections that future generations have an equal right to enjoy. Um, so I just wanted to finish with a couple of um, what I think are really beautiful cartoons that were created by um, Eve Brennan and that the MESO team presented as part of a side event at last year's um, uh, Climate Change COP26 meeting in Glasgow. And the comic tells a story about different futures. So it highlights that the Antarctic and Southern Ocean is home to an ecosystem that holds global significance um, as a heat and carbon sink. And it's a place that captures the imagination of people around the world. And it also supports fisheries and tourism. Um, we highlighted that um, Antarctica is a key part of global ocean circulation, that phytoplankton and krill form the foundation of um, a diverse ecosystem where marine predators um, travel from the equator or live only on sea ice and where we have um, unique bottom dwellers that evolved in freezing waters and need them to remain cold. And so we, in, this pre in the presentation at COP26, we highlighted um, the need for climate change mitigation to continue the ecosystem processes that everyone needs. Um, and we also asked the COP26 um, side event audience to consider two possible futures for Southern Ocean biodiversity. Um, by limiting warming to 1.5 degrees, um, there's an option to preserve and maintain the key things we care about and depend on from the Southern Ocean, but beyond that level, our current scientific understanding is that um, ecosystem services will be degraded and that we will lose biodiversity. 
Um, and so I think we're at a point now where there's ample evidence identifying the set of actions that are needed to safeguard Antarctic marine biodiversity and they are uh, global policy on climate change mitigation to ensure sustainability of ecosystems and services, enhanced resilience um, through providing refuges that can aid recovery, particularly marine protected areas, uh, local and regional conservation and management that's precautionary and, and responsive. Um, and finally, and, and I think this echoes um, you know, what we've heard across other talks, the need for a multi-state colder approach across national programs and governments, um, industry, the Antarctic Treaty System, the UNFCCC and NGOs. Um, and I've gone backwards, um, but thank you uh, again for um, inviting me today. Thanks so much, Jess. That's fantastic. Um, and um, yeah, I think it's it's really good when we um, see the, the the legal presentations and um, how they tie together with um, presentations at the science policy interface, like Jess presents to us. Um, it's so important, and we're seeing more and more of it. I attended ATCM this year, and um, the papers are now public, so you can um, go into the um, treaty website um, and see them, and you can actually see a lot of this this work. Um, coming together more and more you see it every year so I encourage those that are interested to go and, and, and look at those as well so thank you so much Jess we will push along so we can get some question time I don't see any specific questions to um, Jess right now but um, I know she needs to push off right on the dot so we'll go on straight on to Marcus so I'd like to welcome Professor Marcus Howard um, Marcus is a professor political scientist specialising in oceans and Antarctic governance here at IMAS at the University of Tasmania. He's uh, currently a professor in the Oceans and Cryosphere Centre um, and a program leader at the Sustainable Offshore Development Program at the Blue Economy Cooperative Research Centre. Marcus has held adjunct appointments at the Australian Maritime College, the Antarctic Division and the Australian National University and Dalhousie University in Canada. He's also a member of the Centre for Marine Socioecology at the University of Tasmania down here. He's an honorary professor at the Centre for Policy Futures at the University of Queensland. And today, Marcus is going to present on marine biodiversity conservation in the Southern Ocean, lessons from the Commission for the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources. So over to you, Professor Howard. Uh, thanks, Indy. I presume you can see my screen. I'm having some problems. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. I'd, I'd li also like to acknowledge the, uh, the fact that uh, I'm on Lutruita um, and Tasmanian, acknowledge Tasmania's original um, people, the Moina people, and their continuing custodianship and interest in the lands and waters on which I'm working. Um, I'm just I wish to acknowledge and thank to the um, organisers of the conference and inviting me on here. I want to speak today about some of the lessons or ideas that come from Kamala, the Commission for the Conservation of Antarctic and Marine Living Resources. And I think my, my presentation links neatly into the preceding th presentations and uh, the scene's been set really well. I want to um, just really focus on a bit of my origins of, of, of Kamala, uh, the, both the convention and the commission, which have the, both the similar acronym, talk a little bit about its, its role and function in the area of application, and then come and come address some of the key issues and um, areas of um, application and how they can inform our focus on current debates and discussions on marine biodiversity conservation. Uh, in a sense, um, the Convention for the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources, the Camelar Convention, really emerged out of concern over unregulated krill fishing in the Southern Ocean and, and in the 1970s. Um, basically, as we've heard from Jess, krill are critical elements in the food chain within the Southern Ocean. And the early krill fishing uh, in the 19, in 1970s grew significantly and led to action um, through the Antarctic Treaty Consultative Meeting in 1977, particularly recommendation 11.2, uh, that provided the process by which a, 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 a framework to conserve Antarctic marine living resources. And the guidelines for the conservation of Antarctic marine living resources are really important. Kamala, right from the start, was about conservation. It was about conservation within a framework um, that allowed harvesting, but it was not a fishing um, organisation. It's a conservation body. And so in a sense, 
the lessons for governance for marine biodiversity that Kamala have had over the last 40 years, I think provide a significant, um, um, in a sense, uh, opportunity to learn as we are trying to extend these uh, provisions into more broader um, areas beyond national jurisdiction. The critical element of um, Kamalar is of course, article two of the convention. And it's, it's presented here, I won't read it, but it, many of you would know this. It is the objective in, in part one is the conservation of Antarctic marine living resources. Then of course, it, the convention uh, states in part two that conservation includes rational use. Currently, there is a discussion and debate about the idea that this that we should balance rational use with conservation. This is not the reading of Article Two, and in a sense, you see in um, Part Three the notions of both ecosystem and ecosystem-based management that Jess has indicated is critically important in in managing current stresses on the system. Um, is presented, but also a precautionary approach. In a sense, Kamala predates a lot of the work on precaution that came through in the following decades through the UN, uh, UN uh, forums, particularly starting in the um, uh, unsaid meeting in 1992. So Kamala is a particularly interesting area um, convention. It covers the Southern Ocean, but of course it extends beyond the Antarctic Treaty area that set it south of 60 um, to, to deal with the issue of um, the particular marine environment and conditions of the Southern Ocean. It's, it's like all illegal instruments, it has its boundaries um, or most legal instruments, boundaries of its um, application put in there, but those boundaries um, purported to follow what, was, what we now call a polar front at the time was known as the Antarctic Convergent which is a physical and, and biological oceanographic feature separating the Southern Ocean um, Antarctic waters from the warmer, more um, temperate areas. And in a sense, this environmental and uh, um, physical and biological um, feature um, was, is, emphasizes the, the, the notion of an ecosystem. Now, of course, this, there are some complexities in this um, drawing of this, Region, of course, first I've mentioned that it, it extends beyond the Kamala area in certain places, and uh, as we can see here, um, but there are some um, other complexities because it incorporates the sovereign territories of um, sub-Antarctic islands of a number of, of countries, um, and in a sense, uh, involved immediately involves um, some governance questions in relation to application of Kamala uh, regulations and rules. There are provisions in, the, in the, the convention to address the challenges that this might arise. Um, in a sense, there's a, in the final act of the, 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 the uh, diplomatic conference, uh, what was called the chairman's statement uh, was incorporated into the convention, which in effect allows countries with uh, sovereign territories within the Kamalar area um, that are also members of the commission to in a sense assert that um, uh, their rights as sovereign entities. Other countries um, like Australia have not ever, um, have not uh, asserted the chairman's statement, but in a sense reserve the right to go with domestic law in their sub-Antarctic uh, territories, uh, particularly around Heard Islands and McDonald Islands to, and Macquarie Island to is set, uh, sorry, uh, the, sorry, Coriolan is outside the Kamala area, but to assert stronger uh, management requirements for their Australian fishes in those zones. So the Kamala Convention is, in a sense, a um, includes a focus on conservation. It includes an explicit focus on ecosystem uh, based management in relation to time and space, harvesting dependent and, so, and related and associated populations. It excludes whales and seals because they are ad addressed by um, other instruments. It follows the Antarctic uh, Treaty um, 
provisions um, in many ways, including its focus on consensus decision making, and hence a challenge, of course, that absence, um, you know, a single objection can in fact lead to uh, measures not being uh, adopted. We also see um, a focus on um, science very heavily in the, um, the work of, of Camelar. Basically, right from the start, it was science was to inform decision making and it fam epitomized famously by the um, um, comment in, in the um, negotiation sessions, the special um, Antarctic consultative meetings leading to the negotiation of the instrument by the head of the British delegation at the time, John Heap, saying, uh, no data, no fish. The, right from the start, the need for science informing decision-making is, is critical. So best available science um, is there. The scientific committee provides advice to the commission and in a sense, the focus is to uh, this conservation objective. The, sorry, I was, in terms of um, um, the link with the Antarctic uh, Treaty and the broader system, Camelar is both embedded in the sense that it, its provisions um, in, in, in certain cases, Article 4, for example, replicates the Article 4 of the Antarctic Treaty. Um, but it's also freestanding. Um, members can join Camelar without um, um, the Camelar Convention, a seat to the Camelar Convention, without joining the Antarctic Treaty. Um, but this, so in a sense, it's, it's an important body within the Antarctic um, system of governance. Uh, and in a sense may well be, um, you know, in, in its development of its own governance roles, provide again insights for us when we start to deal with the challenges of marine uh, biodiversity conservation. So um, one of the things that we actually, um, um, in it, that we learn from Kamala can provide into the future for, um, marine biodiversity uh, conservation and law is its, its experience in um, area-based management. Um, it's small scale management areas. Camelar has been significant in providing um, innovative approaches to dealing with um, the, the spatial variability in the, air, in the area that Jess has pointed out. But small scale management areas, it's been a pioneer in developing rules and approaches for vulnerable marine ecosystems or VMEs dealing with um, ways to, to identify such areas and rules for fishing when um, fishing in, encounters uh, benthic environments that, are, that, are, that um, have um, significant um, uh, and vulnerable species. In a sense, a move on rule has been um, ad uh, adopted and in a sense, depending on the um, size of the scale of the um, landings of particular species, the, the uh, provisions um, are, are clear. More interestingly, and perhaps, perhaps potentially contentiously, Camelar has also um, uh, established um, marine, a marine protected area in the Ross Sea. Um, this is proposals to establish MPAs are often contentious wherever they are, but it's in fact, Camelar was a pioneer as it has been a pioneer in a number of areas of um, uh, ocean governance. The, um, um, with the first high seas MPA with the South Orkney Island Southern Shelf MPA in 2009. And then after many years of discussion, the Ross Sea MPA, um, marine protected, a multiple use marine protected area in the Ross Sea region. Now, the challenge, of course, with the, um, um, the uh, Ross Sea MPA has then been uh, paralleled with difficulties in gaining consensus over other initiatives on marine protected areas in the East Antarctic, East Antarctic area and in the Weddell, uh, Weddell Sea. Um, and in a sense, a lack of consensus um, by, with a small number of parties objecting um, make, makes the um, 
Camelars uh, continue innovation and responsiveness to operationalizing, you know, ecosystem approaches are potentially challenging. So, in a sense, while Camelar has been a leader in ecosystem based uh, management and in adopting a precautionary approach, and in a sense, providing a governance framework for areas beyond national jurisdiction, given the particular character of the Southern Ocean uh, within the uh, um, Antarctic um, Treaty and Camelar areas, um, there are significant um, issues that we that, um, need to be aware of. How do we maintain effective ecosystem-based management in, in terms of ongoing uh, developments relating to the, the new science that, that is emerging in relation particularly to climate change? Um, that Jess's presentation is, is really significant here in a sense that we need to be more adaptive and more um, uh, responsive to the, the science that's coming in and showing that the Southern Ocean is, is, is increasingly vulnerable. We need to really focus back on the conservation um, aspect of, of Camelar. We also need to recognise the changing dynamics in global fisheries, including a, um, the changes that have occurred in the last 10 to 15 years in the krill fishery, um, that in fact, the krill fishery, while at the moment is well within sustainable limits, there are some concerns in, in um, that there may well be local localised um, um, hotspots of fishing uh, in, the, um, in, this, in the South Atlantic particularly. And the krill fishery particularly is the one that Camelar needs to pay continued attention to. And again, the, the issue again of, of impacts of climate change, really important ones here. Um, Jess has gone through those and Camelar needs to, to, to address these significantly. Now, in conclusion, the, the, the point that um, I want to make is that the Camelar Convention has been innovative. Um, it's addressed a, a range of a, approaches and operationalised them. It is dealt with um, effectively with the problem of IUU fishing. It has um, provided the leadership in dealing with um, incidental catches of seabirds that have led to other uh, and ongoing international agreements. Its focus on marine living resources was deliberate. It's not just about fish. The science-based decision-making is really important. And one of the, the concerns that's happening at the moment is that that science base is being eroded by um, continual challenges to and just debates over, over um, the science as presented. And the, co the concept of rational use needs to be seen as an operational um, aspect of the conservation objective um, and really important. But it is a really important model for linking marine resource and environmental management in an effective governance um, framework that has lasted for 40 years. And hence it provides significant lessons for emerging concerns over biodiversity conservation in um, areas beyond national jurisdiction. And I just, I think I will stop there. Um, uh, Indy. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Marcus. All right. So we've reached the end of our speakers. And um, before Jess, I know Jess has to go. Um, so in, in a few minutes, but what I'll quickly do, there is a question for you, um, Jess, in the Q&A. Um, and I'll read it out for you. Um, and it's from Dr. Sri Watini. And it's about the um, impacts that you described about uh, climate change in Antarctica. And I would just like you to elaborate a bit more about the limits of adaptation and the concepts of um, refuges. And I guess we're probably more a legal audience. So probably just a bit more detail, I guess, for. Um, more of our audience, um, because it is really important as Marcus was just talking about, and I guess the discussions that uh, Professor Chen, and uh, Associate Professor Chen were talking about, we're, we're entering phases of um, adaptation in the law as well. So um, yeah, any, any extra information you could give us? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Indy, and apologies that I have to 
um, leave at, um, at half past the hour. It's a busy time of year for us here at SARO at the moment with um, project deadlines before the end of financial year. So apologies. And thank you, Sri, for the great question. I have been busily typing a response, actually, <laughs> which I nearly finished, but perhaps I'll just read out what I've, <laughs> what I've written. So I was saying, um, so in terms of um, limits to adaptation, I think that's, that's kind of twofold and I, I didn't do a very good job of unpacking that, sorry. Uh, the first part is because um, Antarctic marine species, <laughs> Antarctic species generally, but particularly marine species are so highly adapted to very cold polar environments. That, that means they have very limited capacity to deal with the kinds of rapid temperature increases and associated changes in ocean acidification. Um, for instance, loss of habitats like sea ice, um, and so some species can kind of retreat south to where it remains a bit colder and we have evidence that krill, um, Antarctic krill are already doing that. Um, but of course, it's a limited space available to retreat eventually. Um, you just hit the Antarctic continent. So that's, that links to actually to the question about refugia. Um, in terms of human interventions that might constitute adaptation to protect biodiversity, we also have um, significant limits there. That's partly because there's not really any large scale actions that we can take apart from um, the kinds of resilience building things I talked about um, that, you know, that we might have available for other regions. So, you know, examples are large scale adaptation interventions to protect coral reefs or some of the adaptation options that are available in the Arctic, um, for instance. And so in terms of um, strategies to address those limits to adaptation by building resilience, um, refugia are an option because they, an important option because they remove other direct impacts. Um, particularly harvesting, but also, you know, presence of humans more generally that um, might generate pollution, for instance. And so that doesn't solve the climate change impacts, but it buys extra time for species to be able to respond. Um, it, it buffers some of these food web processes that I talked about if we still have important source regions for things like krill. Um, and it also buys um, some time in terms of the action um, well, it addresses the issue that we have this lag um, in the climate system so that even if emissions are uh, reduced tomorrow, we're still going to see these ongoing temperature um, changes. And so, you know, how do we um, provide regions for species where they can retreat to um, and not be impacted by other activities? Is that, India, is that kind of okay in terms of an answer to that question? Yeah, I think that's fantastic. Thank okay, you. Thank you. <laughs> um, all right. So, having a quick look to see if we've got any more questions no um i guess this is um a chance for anyone else who's on the line to ask any questions no i guess to marcus following on from that um what's your um crystal ball saying in terms of following on from what Jess just, just said in terms of, oh, hang on, um, in terms of, yeah, future, the future, I guess, in MPAs oh, in the yeah. form of that. I think, um, I think it's important, but I'm actually fairly, uh, I, I'm, I'm concerned that, um, that despite the commitments to um, best available science and science-based decision-making, um, the, the particular um, trend at the moment in Camelar is not is, is negative in this regard. I'm really quite concerned that Camelar is um, needs to reassert its um, significant um, commitment to ecosystem based management and con um, conservation of Antarctic marine living resources and in a sense look to emerging um, science and emerging tools not just look back. My concern is that Camelar will will by default become a very average now because um, rather than the, a good fisheries body and that's not what it's about um, and I'm I'm concerned because in a sense 20 years ago Camelar was leading uh, many of the areas and there are other organizations that have overtaken Camelar in many of their, um, their, their focuses so I think that we need to take this on board the commission 
and its members need to take this seriously and address new tools for um, protection of um, species. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, all right. Well, we don't have any more questions in the question box. Um, Indy, there's just one question in the chat. Oh, in the chat. Oh, sorry. Over here. Um, is Antarctica region is the Antarctic region a place we can incorporate the rights of nature given its global values and lack of indigenous populations? Oh goodness, um, that's a good good question, Lynn. Um, yeah. Before, hang on, just before um, Jess goes, um, Neng, we do we want a quick picture um, because Jess is going to go quick. Uh, I already screenshot. So don't worry, you will see a You've big done a screen, done kind of a screenshot photo on Twitter. Cool. Excellent. Everyone smile. Right. Excellent. Um, Link, oh, okay. Uh, who wants to tackle this one, guys? Me? I don't know, make me do it. Marcus. I'm happy to have it out. I think I, I think that um the important thing here is that again, a new concept, you know, just as Kamala. Um, um, the discussions in the 1980s opened up a new a, a new way of doing things uh, with relation to marine resource management um, and conservation. So too, I think we do need to look at these issues there. I'm again, I think it's important, and it's going to be difficult to you know, given the um, particular attitudes that are in Kamala at the moment. I think it's going to be more difficult uh, to see it successful, but it's um, it's important. I think an important um, step forward. Thanks, Jess. Um, and from Kath, can the idea of uh, rational use be clearly interpreted as rational use? Um, yeah, look, I mean, maybe um, our lawyers, our um, Professor Chen or Associate Professor Chen, um, the interpretation of rational use. Um, oh. Can the idea of rational use be seen as ecological functions? Um, I don't know if either of you want to have a think about that as a question. I, I, <laughs> while I'm thinking about it, so I'm, I'm happy to Marcus, chip in. Um, I think that's right. a really interesting point that Kath Wallace has made um, because in a way the argument that's going at the moment is that Rational use is um, is somehow related to extraction, as she's pointing out, rather than rather than that would be this this idea, in my view, on face value, without thinking it to to, to, to having to think it through, would be, bring it back to the uh, the point that it's related to its the conservation objective, and, and and then therefore an ecological focus. So I think that's a really interesting interesting idea. Again, because um, it's at the moment. We seem to be going down a pathway that it's as as imply. Uh, I agree with Kath Wallace's point that it's about extraction rather than conservation. Yeah, well, is, is there any other? If it's not any other thoughts on that, um, but yeah, look, um, it's that broader interpretive um, concept um, that you look at the broader objectives of the instruments and things like that. So yeah, it's it's, it's just an interesting um, thought. So yeah, definitely. Um, but I don't know if they'll, um, other colleagues have any other thoughts on that, but if not, um, I'm happy to wrap up the session given we're a little tiny bit over time. Um, but other than that, I think I really want to thank our speakers today. Um, so to Professor Chen and Associate Professor Chen, to Marcus Howard, Professor Howard, and um, to Dr. Melbourne Thomas, and to um, all our assistants and organizers at um, Macquarie University. Thank you so much for organizing this session. It's been really interesting. Um, I got a lot out of it, particularly, um, I don't know a lot about the Chinese domestic system. So thank you so much for that. Um, the bioprospecting, I know that's going to um, continue to be a really big issue. So thank you so much for that. Uh, Marcus, thanks for the overview on Kamala. And I always love um, Jess's um, overviews on the science policy interface. They're always just so insightful. Um, so thank you so much. 
and to Bengi and Sarah for your organisation and to Juliang, I'm not sure if he's on the line, um, but thank you so much and yeah, thank you.